তাহলে আমরা এখন স্টার্ট করতে পারি यस ওকে না শুরু করেন আসসালামু আলাইকুম এন্ড গুড ইভিনিং টু অল পার্টিসিপেন্টস টুডে ইন आवर সেশন উই हैव अमंगस्ट আস রিনাউন্ড ইলেকট্রোফিজিওলজিস্ট ডক্টর রফিক আহমেদ স্যার আইড লাইক টু রিকোয়েস্ট প্রফেসর আব্দুল বাদর চৌধুরী স্যার টু সে সাম ওয়ার্ডস अबाउट রফিক আহমেদ স্যার এন্ড স্টার্ট आवर প্রোগ্রাম ওয়াদুদ স্যার Assalamu alaikum and good evening to everybody and this is really my pleasure to introduce Dr Rafiq Ahmed who is actually the founder of electrophysiology service of this country he single handedly bring the all the equipments to this country and himself he bring himself every year three or four times yearly to train our doctors today is professor atar professor mohsin and many others are there to serve us in the electrophysiology because of dr rafiq ahmed we are really grateful to him as a nation and also this is our pleasure from his study group he has always been with us and today he is going to talk about the basics of cardiac arrhythmia we are eagerly awaiting for his the lecture so i'm not uh, telling any more sir you can start yeah. assalamu alaikum good morning um hello please yes screen dekha jacche to na yes sir to sir mute kore assalamu alaikum good morning um ekta amar deri hoye geche ajke um we should try to start on time so ajke jeta korbo we are going to do um, our forum is ecg forum but i was asked to talk about arrhythmia so I'm, i try to blend little bit of uh, basics i think the understanding of basics is important um, just listening to it and remembering from time to time is important uh, for better treatment and also for academic purpose um always i pay homage to my homeland somebody is talking to me about bangladesh and uh, this is our root and i i see this picture i show this picture in all my lectures this is where we all come from and it doesn't matter where we are um in america uh, in bangladesh dhaka rangpur we must remember this village uh, so that we do something for them so this is the basic structure of the heart it's well known um we have the conduction system with the sinus node AV node, right bundle on the right side, and left bundle on the left side. If you look at the difference between the right and the left bundle, right bundle is a narrow structure, a single structure, and then it branches. Left bundle actually is much wider structure. It's flat, wider structure, and then it goes into left anterior fascicle and left posterior fascicle before uh, spreading into the ventricle. and that's why the ecg is very narrow the conduction through the um, parkinji fiber is very fast and that's why we get a qrs complex which is about 80 millisecond somebody was asking why the qrs is narrow um during um sinus rhythm as opposed to ventricular arrhythmia or ventricular premature beat uh, the premature beats go through the myocardial tissue that's why they are very wide and normal qrs conducts through the parkinji fibers a um, little bit of histology the the myocardium is a syncytium that means the cells are connected to each other um and if you see they are oriented longitudinally so it's a very longitudinal orientation there is no uh, haphazard pattern in normal myocardium and uh, this is the histological structure uh, you can see that it is linear and goes along one line which can change in pathological condition that we will come to and this is where the cells junction we have this intercalated disc and that's where the electricity the interesting thing about uh, myocardium is that if we introduce one electrical signal in one cell it will then activate all the cells through this intercalated disc it is unlike skeletal muscle skeletal muscle individual fibers have to be stimulated to to contract and these are uh, different proteins that the intercalated disc binds together and th that 
we don't have to remember all of them, but we need to remember the concept that let's say catenin, cat, uh, desmocholine, placophylline, phylline, these are all related to some pathological processes that we see, and we are finding out more and more um, the genetic abnormalities involved with these uh, uh, proteins. And these are a list of, uh, of the inherited cardiac diseases that we can uh, see in, in real life and um, that uh, are related to some arrhythmia. If you look at arrhythmogenic right ventricular dysplasia here, and it is clearly related to a protein called um, placoglobin uh, uh, abnormality. And we are talking about this uh, uh, cellular structure that they're longitudinally um, oriented. But if you look at a condition in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, you can see these fibers now are growing. Even though the myocardium is hypertrophied, it's a bad pump because the fibers are oriented in multiple directions. And that creates an anatomical problem in contraction. Second problem, it also creates an electrical um, substrate for cardiac arrhythmia. We'll, we'll touch a little bit about the action potential. Multiple speakers have talked about it. I think it's important that we repeat this thing um, again and again to put it in our brain. Action potential, that myocardial cells outside is negative, inside is positive. And if we put an electrical stimulus, it changes, creates an action potential. Inside becomes positive, outside negative, causes cellular um, electrical activity and then myocardial contraction, and then it goes back to normal pattern again during um, depolarization. And how does it happen? Uh, the myocardial cells, uh, all cells are bilipid layer and there are pores, ion channels. And, and you can see these are able to conduct um, electrolytes and that's, thereby it causes electrical activity plus contraction of the myocardium. And just, just conceptually, if you look at this sodium channel, you can see that there is a gate, it's resting, it is closed. And then if it is activated, the gate becomes open and it allows sodium to come in. And then immediate inactivation is done by a small temporary gate. It closes it until it goes to the final resting condition. And if you look at here, there's L, this is where the lidocaine works on the sodium channel. And this is very specific, it's important. Um, if you look at the next slide, if you look at this calcium channel, again, resting, this is activated and then uh, closed. If you look at the drugs, here is where the delta gem works. This is where nifedipine works. And this is where verapamil works. So even though they are working in the same calcium channel, they are working in different locations and it is possible that that can explain the different nature of their activi activity. If you look at nifedipine, it's a very good antihypertensive, but it's not an antiarrhythmic at all. On the other hand, diltiazem is a combination which is good antihypertensive and good antiarrhythmic Verapamil on the other end is more of an antiarrhythmic than hypertensive, antihypertensive. So I think where these drugs are working also uh, decides what will be their mechanism of action. So ventricular action potential um, during uh, depolarization, there is influx of sodium and then sodium continues coming, then potassium, uh, calcium comes in and then potassium goes out and brings it back down to normal level. And this is on the left side, we have the action potential of the SA node. If you see, there is a clear difference. SA node action potential is a sinusoidal activity. That means it continuously works, depolarization and repolarization on its own. And that gives its automaticity. On the other hand, ventricular channel action potential is flat here until there is a stimulation here, it will not activate and produce its own action potential. But we skip through this two slides. What happens if we give drugs? 
Um, if we give drugs like sodium channel blockers, that is prolongation of effective refractory period, that happens mainly because the slope of this initial part changes. So the difference is not big. However, if we use drugs like amiodarone or which potassium channel, this causes more prolongation of the ERP. Um, these are drugs like amiodarone, sotalol. These are potassium channel blockers. So if you look at long QT syndrome, they, they have been diagnosed at different locations of action of this, uh, um, how it happens. Let's say long QT3 is a function of sodium channel. There is gain in function of sodium channel. In Brugada, there is loss of sodium channel function. If you look at short QT, there is gain of potassium channel function and long QT2, same channel, but loss of function. And if you look at um, like long QT1, there's a different mixtures of this loss of function. And then short QT, there is gain of function. So it can cut both ways that if there is more action of that draw, um, channel, it can cause abnormality and perfect is long QT sodium channel. If there is a gain of function, there will be prolongation of QT a condition, long QT3. If there is a loss of function, it will condition like Brugada syndrome. So what are the mechanisms of arrhythmia? Arrhythmia can happen because there is enhanced automaticity. We can have early after depolarization or late after depolarization. Um, it can be re-entry. And there's a new mechanism, reflection. It, it's a little funny concept, but I think it's a form of re-entry that happens in a longitudinal fiber. So the, let's say I take a long piece of um, electric cable, the electricity can go down and then reflect back on itself and come back. And it can happen in, in position like Parking G fiber or in the his bundle, you can have a reflection. It's a very difficult mechanism to prove. Now what happens, enhanced automaticity, let's say the cell was beating at this rate and suddenly for some reason it gets faster. And that's simple concept of enhanced automaticity. Why does it happen? So if we look at this action potential of a sinus node, you can see there is depolarization and then diastolic slope. So if the threshold changes, it next bit can come early. That will be one mechanism. Second will be the diastolic potential goes higher up. It brings it earlier. And this can happen during autonomic adrenaline influx, or we can change the slope of this phase four. And that can also cause, these are the multiple mechanisms that can cause enhanced automaticity. Now, enhanced automaticity can be physiological like this. This is a patient um, with um, sinus tachycardia, heart rate 123. This is fairly physiological, it can happen with fever, somebody becomes hypotensive, or if we start running on a treadmill or exercise, the rate will go up. That's physiological enhanced automaticity. It can be pathological also. Um, it can be like pathological will be a supraventricular premature beat, ventricular premature beat, atrial tachycardia, and certain ventricular tachycardia can also due to enhanced automaticity. An example of this, this is an example that if you look at this, there is, we have sinus rhythm, and then we have a rapid heartbeat, and I can clearly see that there is a sinus P wave and then there is a P wave, which is driving this arrhythmia. So this is, and it's a long RP tachycardia. This is most likely an atrial tachycardia. And this is probably an automatic focus. Somebody can question me that how come it is not re-entry? One can never be 100% sure that this is not re-entry, but one mechanism that distinguishes enhanced automaticity from from re-entry is that there can be some warm up, And if you look at this P to P interval, it's about 300, um, 40 uh, 540 milliseconds. But as we go down, it gets a little faster. And that means there is a little bit of warm up. If we see warm up in a tachycardia, 
it points towards enhanced automaticity as opposed to um, re-entry. And we can see that in some of the ventricular tachycardias, if we look at catecholaminergic polymorphic ventricular tachycardia, which is actually a form of enhanced automaticity, um, you can um, see there will be um, some change or automatic ventricular tachycardia, there can be some, some acceleration of the tachycardia as, continues, as it continues. But unfortunately, the problem is that in some of the reentrant tachycardia, you can also see some warm up. So that makes it very difficult to distinguish the two. After depolarization, there can be two types. One is delayed after depolarization, which happens in phase four or early after depolarization, which happens in phase two or phase three. And if this signal is big enough, then it can produce a signal on its own. And you can see this pattern. And as I was talking that there can be phase two early after depolarization. These are calcium current dependent or phase four, phase three is potassium dependent. Phase four is a totally different mechanism. It can be both calcium overload or due to sodium potassium pump problem. And what are the arrhythmias that can happen with uh, after the early after depolarization, we all know torsad that we see in long QT with drugs or long QT arrhythmias because in long QT syndrome, most of the time that the arrhythmia that we get will be um, torsad. And delayed after depolarization, arrhythmia with digital toxicity, like actual tachycardia that happens in digital toxicity, they are delayed after depolarization. Accelerated idioventricular rhythm in acute myocardial infarction, or sometimes after angioplasty for acute MI or thrombolytics, we will see ventricular arrhythmia, reperfusion arrhythmia. Those are actually delayed after depolarization. Some of the right ventricular outflow of tachycardia and also catecholaminergic polymorphic ventricular tachycardia, they are delayed after depolarization. And this form can actually be two types. One will be calcium overload, and the second type, which is related to catecholamines only. And those are sensitive to verapamil, calcium channel blocker, and also adenosine can terminate this VT. So we use adenosine sometimes to distinguish um, VT and SVT, but please remember, Catecholaminergic, catecholaminergic polymorphic ventricular tachycardia uh, can respond to verapamil. It, it is called verapamil sensitive ventricular tachycardia. So this is an example of Tersad. Um, we have long QT and there is one beat and then we have this polymorphic arrhythmia um, that is self-terminating. Um, one of the questions that somebody asked me, what is the difference between VF and polymorphic ventricular tachycardia? Basically almost similar. Most of the polymorphic ventricular tachycardia will self-terminate, but uh, VF will not self-terminate. Re-entry is the main thing that causes majority of the arrhythmia that we see. This is a very old concept. Early 1900, it was done on a jellyfish. So let's say we take this tissue and we cut a hole in the center. So we have a strip of tissue that can conduct electricity. If I introduce an electrical signal here, it will go in both direction. And once they meet in the center, they will collide and they will extinguish because they have nowhere to go. However, let's say I put a pressure here on this strip. I introduce an electrical signal. It cannot go this way because it is blocked. It can come down this way. And by the time it comes here, if I take this block off, it can then continue round and round because there is an excitable gap ahead of it. It can continue for a period of time until this disappears, this opening disappears. And that's the mechanism of most of the tachycardia that we see in clinical practice, like AV node reentry, atrial ventricular reentry, atrial flutter, and most. Um, scar related ventricular tachycardia. So this barrier, now in real life, there is no hole in, in heart, except in actual flutter, because in actual flutter, there is inferior vena cover that creates a hole. So the hole that can be created can be anatomic barrier. Uh, let's take an example. We take a ventricular myocardial, and there is an infarct in this area, and this becomes a scar. 
and that's an anatomic barrier and then the electricity can go around it or if this is the inferior vena cava the electricity can go around the inferior vena cava and produce a a, a re-entry circuit there can also be functional barrier that's a difficult concept because what happens is that electrical signal penetration can make this tissue functionally refractory and that creates a functional barrier and re-entry can happen around it. This is a scar-related ventricular tachycardia. This is a just diagrammatic representation. The dark shades are the ones that is infarcted tissue. And these are healthy tissue that can conduct electricity. So what can happen that an electrical signal will come in, goes through this channel and then come out. As soon as it come out, comes out, we start seeing, seeing the electrical signal, which is the QRS complex. And then once the whole myocardium is depolarized, we become isoelectric until the next signal starts. Please remember that this signal is going through this channel and it will produce a regular RR interval. However, let's for theoretical purpose, the AVT is happening through this channel at a rate of 150 bits per minute. If this electricity goes through this, it will take shorter time and will come out, it can become faster. But the morphology will remain same because the exit point is same. So VT is most of the time regular, but sometimes we can see irregularity in ventricular tachycardia mainly because of this mechanism that the exit point is same, the VT looks same, but the circuit, maybe there is a second pathway that is being used. One pathway that takes shorter time causes faster VT, one pathway that takes longer time causes slower VT, and there can be oscillation between the two. So, this is the mechanism, one of the mechanisms that has been explained to used to explain irregularity in RR interval in ventricular tachycardia. The other reentry that we see is bundle bench reentry. These are the patients normally will present with ventricular tachycardia, which either will look like typical right bundle or typical left bundle. And most of this happen in dilated cardiomyopathy. So what can happen? That Electrical signal can go down through the right bundle and produce re-entry, and that produces left bundle morphology. Or if it goes the other way around, if it goes down the left bundle and comes to the right bundle backward, it will produce a tachycardia, which is, looks like right bundle morphology. And the treatment for this is very interesting because if you just ablate one of these pathways, you can get rid of this tachycardia. So ablation is very, very good in treating this condition as long as we have a proper diagnosis. But when you, when you look at these tachycardias, it will be very, very difficult to differentiate between a ventricular tachycardia or SVT with underlying bundle band block. Supraventricular tachycardia, I'm going to touch base a little bit. Um, these are all different type of reentrant tachycardias. So this is an example of a um, tachycardia, that narrow QRS tachycardia, and almost invisible P wave. However, if we look carefully, there is a P wave in lead two. And maybe in V1, there is a notch in the terminal part of the QRS complex, which is within 80 millisecond of the QRS complex that makes the diagnosis of AV node reentry more likely than anything else. We can, we should never say it is 100% V AV node. I will always tell patient people that look, 80 to 90% of the time I'm correct, 10% time I'll be wrong. And how does it happen? There is longitudinal electrical dissociation in the AV node. One pathway conducts fast, one pathway conducts slow. So in this case, what's happening? That the electrical signal is going down through the fast pathway and producing a normal QRS. It's a long, normal PR interval. However, if there is a premature bit, it can block in the fast pathway because fast pathway has longer refractory period. And then it can go down the slow pathway producing a longer PR interval. However, it did not create an SVT. If we move forward, if now, when it comes to the bottom of the AV node, if the fast pathway is open, it can go backward. Still, it will require one more factor, 
it has to find this slow pathway open. And if that happens, then it can go around the AV node slow pathway and then go round and round and produce this AV node reentrant tachycardia. Interesting is that the AV node, even though we describe it as a round structure, at the heart motion, they are always doing AV node ablation, AV node reentry ablation. If it were like this, really there will be high incidence of heart block. As a matter of fact, AV node is a little bit bigger structure and the slow pathway anatomically is located somewhere here within about a centimeter of each other. That's why we don't see that many heart block with AV node reentrant tachycardia ablation. So this is another narrow QRS tachycardia. It's a little different from the other one. If you look at it, you see that there's a P wave here probably. Um, and it's consistent, I can see in other leads, all, other, all the EKGs. So it looks like a RPPR, is, it's tough to say which is long, almost equal. But the, if we see a ECG like this, our primary diagnosis will be an atrioventricular reentrant tachycardia. And sure enough, this same patient, when patient goes into sinus rhythm, we can see this WPW syndrome, which makes the diagnosis of atrioventricular reentry more likely. But I have to caution you about one thing. The fact that somebody has WPW syndrome does not mean that that patient cannot have AV node reentry. So we have to keep an open mind about it. That's why we do when we do electrophysiology study, we need to induce that tachycardia and make sure that the, the arrhythmia that patient was having was atrioventricular reentry rather than an AV node reentry with bystander accessory pathway. So how does it happen that Atrioventricular reentry, an electrical signal can do, go down through the normal pathway and then come back through the accessory pathway and produce uh, this reentrant circuit. It sometimes can go the other way around and also produce a wide QRS um, supraventricular tachycardia. This is uh, another arrhythmia that we see quite a lot. And interestingly, in Bangladesh, we don't see many atrial flutter as opposed to fibrillation. In the United States, there are a lot of cases of atrial flutter. And if you see this is a sawtooth appearance, and what happens with this arrhythmia? There is a reentry. There is an area of, so this is inferior vena cava. And on this side, I have tricuspid fog. And there is a narrow isthmus. Typical atrial flutter will always go down medially through this isthmus and come back. And that makes it easy to ablate because if I do ablation in the atrium, the circuit will just move other way. But if there is an anatomical barrier, which is inferior vena cava and the tricuspid annulus, I can do an ablation here and cure atrial flutter. And success rate is close to um, 95 to 100%. But we, when we see this arrhythm, we have to prove that this circuit is involved and that we can map it. Interestingly, that the, the very interesting, I remember I went to Bangladesh many years ago and trying to explore to start EP service, and somebody told me that EP is not for us. And then I told him a story. One of my professors in 1970 said, why do we need cardiologist? We can take care of everything. And he was a respected medical medicine physician. And look at Bangladesh now. In a, it was a, unimaginable that Bangladesh will have EP. And now we, Bangladesh has electrophysiology. Not only that, we have three-dimensional EP mapping in Bangladesh. I mean, technologically, Bangladesh is as good as any other developed country in the world. We can provide everything that is done. It is the question of the scope. The only limitation in Bangladesh is that we, we have not been able to provide it across the country yet. I think it is coming. I think I, I can guarantee you that within by before we die, we'll see that these highly complex procedures will be done all over Bangladesh. Uh, in, in, smaller towns, Rangpur, Russia, Chittagong, those places. So this is another arrhythmia that happens. It is common that in the old days, when people did atrial septal defect repair, they will cut the atrium and suture it, and that will produce a scar tissue. And then you can have an arrhythmia, atrial flutter around the scar tissue. What the surgeons do nowadays, they extend this incision line up to the IVC. Because if they did it, then you don't have that opening here. And when we get, we find this arrhythmia, we can find this arrhythmia and we can ablate in this area. So 
And this is three dimension mapping of an actual flutter is being done in Bangladesh now. The other part, so I'm going to stop here. Um, I wanted to make this just a little bit shorter than normal lectures and we are already delayed. So I'm going to stop here. Any question I'll take or uh, then we'll do some EKGs. Not many ECGs today. Thank you. Sir, thank you, sir. Athar Bhai. Professor Athar Ali. Sir, Athar, sir. was actually directly listening to it. So today we have amongst us a uh, professor and head of the Department of Medicine, Professor Jaki Hussain from Baguda, Professor Ismail Patwari from Select, and as a Professor Kanish Fatima, she is uh, from Critical Care Medicine instructor. He is there. And also the cardinal from Kajuti side, Professor Mujumdar sir, Jodhari Meshkat sir, and many others are present, sir. And also Orun, Orun Maski, Professor Orun Maski from Nepal is here, sir. So uh, you are very correct that we need uh, not in depth, but rather a introductory lecture to the mechanism and everything. So that uh, the junior fellows and also those from uh, internal medicine background can actually grasp what we are talking about. So uh, there are, uh Two what can I say? Thank you very much, Rafiq, Dr. Rafiq Ahmed, Rafiq Bhai. Uh, as uh, I, I have no adjectives found suitable to describe you because you are, for the last two decades or more, you are constantly, constantly and consistently with us about the different different meetings, workshops, and your contributions to the development of the electrophysiological services uh, need not mention again. The one thing, uh, the arrhythmias and the mechanism particularly is always very challenging uh, subject to understand for the, for me at least, it is very difficult to understand the electrophysiological aspect. Uh, is it there is a maze operation is still there in the United States for the uh, surgeons to uh, to uh, uh, diminish the active fibrillation in the enlarged atrium or something? Maze operation is there? The, the question is whether maze operation is still done. The original surgical maze was done by cutting the atrium and suturing it. But now they have modified what the surgeons do, if somebody is going for valve surgery and has actual fibrillation, they will first of all clip the appendage off and they will do radio frequency ablation of the atrium to mimic the maze, old maze procedure. On, on so the not, heart, in the during the open, operation? During open heart surgery, that adds, that adds about 10, 15 minutes to the procedure. I see. So, yes, and it is routinely done. And there is a uh, there is there are um, radio frequency clamps available. So what they do, they put the clamp and clamp the myocardium plus radio frequency current. And it's a pretty neat technique. And what happens, a lot of those patients will not have AFib. And if they do have AFib, subsequently we'll bring them to the lab because what happens when you do the radio frequency ablation, the tissue can heal up. So if these patients have recurrent arrhythmia, then we can bring to the EP lab and find the gaps and ablate that area. I see. Thank you I for see. a nice question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, sir. Uh, uh, my, my question is that, uh, that understanding the mechanism is particularly important, important for electrophysiologists. But for the general cardiologist also from the medicine background, from treatment purpose, do we need to understand that much? Does it have uh, that much of an impact? It's a question, right, to me. Yes, I, I think I think the mechanism, understanding mechanism stimulates our brain. That's one part. And second is clearly 
even for me, sometimes I will just treat patients with a medicine and then suddenly I'll read something up. Ah, it now makes sense why this is working, why is verapamil working? And the other part is that if we don't, let's say I can become a physician for 10, five, 10 years without reading books, but suddenly one day I'll find myself totally blind because during the 10 year period, medicine has progressed so much that I'm totally lost. I think that's why it's important. And there are two kinds of understanding learning. One is active learning. I always tell people that I'm a cardiac electrophysiologist. I don't treat patients with hypercholesterolemia, but I learn from the general cardiologists. I attend their lectures and I get this passive learning so that I, I keep myself up. And the mechanism I think is very, very important to read. Thank you. Uh, that's, that's what also I believe. And that's why I was asking this question, but many of the fellows actually asking, do I need to understand that much? But I tell them, you may forget, it doesn't matter, but you listen to that. You have to have some inspiration to learn more. That's the uh, most important part. Sir, so, uh, it's my part for sir. Can I, I'll uh, just give an example. You know, you don't need to know motorcycle to ride a motorcycle. But if you get stuck in the middle of somewhere and you are the only person, you need to know how to change the tires and you will only be able to do that if you know uh, the structure. Thank you. Sir, what was the way? Explain, thank you, Bolpin. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor uh, Rafiq Ahmed, for his excellent uh, explanation of this uh, reentry and other mechanism of tachycardia. I have a query. So, in this era of COVID 19, what yes. is the actual mechanism of tachycardia? and other arrhythmias during this COVID infection and how to treat this case. Even we have, we have seen many of the cases uh, in the post-COVID era, they also um, uh, complaining of this undue tachycardia and how to treat this case. Yes. The, the question is uh, the COVID crisis and arrhythmia. Uh, one is that, first of all, the spectrum will be the same. Second, COVID, and interestingly, is, is a very, very multi-system disease. And, and one of the thing would be, first of all, if somebody has sinus tachycardia, they can be from the sickness itself. But other issue would be that we see patients with inappropriate sinus tachycardia in their life. But those are, I see four or five patients a year. Is it possible that the COVID is affecting the autonomic system in some way that is increasing that? That's a possibility. Treatment-wise, it should be same treatment as any other arrhythmia that we do. Of course, the limitation would be somebody is hypotensive and has sinus tachycardia, we cannot give it a blocker. So those are the situations that the limitations we have. Thank you. Hello. Yes, find, finding that during infection, some of patients are present with the inappropriate bradycardia. Then, uh, when they're getting recovered, they're having sinus tachycardia, very inappropriate, persistent sinus tachycardia. Same patient. Yeah. I mean, it's probably something to do with the autonomic system, um, autonomic imbalance. Sir, we were going to our faculties. That is, a, uh, we have got some distinguished panelists here today. Sir, we were going to them. Sir, one question from me. Yeah. Sir, sir uh, during the discussion of the arrhythmias, we always discuss about the tachycardia. Do you have anything to say about the mechanism of Brady arrhythmia, sir? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, I on purpose avoided it. There was a slide actually I removed. Um, one is sinus bradycardia. And when I showed you the slide of autonomic enhanced automaticity, if you increase the parasympathetic tone, you can go to the reverse. That means you can take the diastolic potential down and the patient can become bradycardic. So that's one. Second will be, of course, um, arrhythmias, that bradyarrhythmias can happen if there is a sinus node dysfunction, um, can be from fibrosis, if the sinus node can lose its function and become bradycardic or be taken over by other rhythm. Third will be if there is a problem with the conduction system. And those are anatomical problems. So if somebody has uh, fibrosis or uh, because of old age, uh, the AV node um, uh, gets blocked or his bundle gets blocked. You can develop complete heart block or patients with acute MI can 
um, acutely damage the conduction system and produce complete heart block. So those are the few mechanisms. The transient ones are autonomic tone dilated bradyarrhythmia. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, sir uh, Professor Zaki Roshan. Hello. Zaki Roshan. Uh, Arun Maski. Do you have any comment or question, Dr. Arun Maski? Well, this is a new field for me in arrhythmia. Not my field. I'm learning from uh, Dr. Rafik and I've joined and I've asked my old residents, maybe I, I think today 10 or more from Nepal are joining. So I'm learning. I'm a panelist here. I'm learning from you a lot of arrhythmias, which I, in my practice, I've missed because most of the arrhythmias, when they come, what I do is I send to our EP fellows, they manage. So nice to learn from you, sir. And I've asked my residents to join you. So that's very good. Thank you very much for Thank you. giving Thank insight. You, Thank you. Sir, sir, we were going to our panelist. One more question from me, sir. Sir, the, the, sir, the two pathways in the AB node, that is the fast and the slow. Is it always congenital or can it be acquired, sir? I think the question is that the slow fast pathway, I mean, these are all always there. I think you can dissociate any tissue electrically. I think that physiological property is, is there. Um, if you look at that, let's forget about the AV node, the his bundle. You can electrically dissociate his bundle longitudinally. Um, and there are proof of that. The, the fibers, the AV node, as I mentioned, is not a round structure. There are a lot of extension, downward extension from the AV node towards the coronary center. And that is the area that has slow conduction. The other part that you will find out that in the early days of EP, we did EP study on patients who never had SVT and significant number showed property of dual avenodal physiology. So these are congenital and not always necessarily pathological issue because it, a lot of times it doesn't cause any pathological problem. Thank you. Thank you, sir. That's all. <laughs> Professor Mishka Ahmed Choudhury. Thank, thank you, sir. It has been a brilliant presentation on your part. Uh, <clears throat> I, I work in Bangamundi Sheikh Mujib Medical University, where there we do not have the EP facilities. Uh, what happens when, when you're lacking some facilities, you really lag behind in the knowledge in that subject. And uh, for the same reason, I understand so little about electrophysiology and other things. But one arrhythmia that has become prevalent nowadays, probably all over the world, uh, one of the reasons may be that uh, people also do have monitoring even throughout the whole year because they have some device implanted in them and uh, which make them also to monitor the ECG for one year. And in those studies also, it, it has been found that actual fibrillation is quite prevalent. And to me, it appears that probably there is an sort of epidemics within the epidemics of, of heart disease. We, we find many cases of atrial fibrillation, that, that was my point. And each atrial fibrillation differs from one, in regards presentation, each atrial fibrillation differs from other one. And as, as we understand that despite controlling the rhythm in those patients, despite, uh, despite the fact that we are able to convert them into the sinus rhythm, they also has to, has to be on anticoagulant as well, if they qualify the CHADVAS score. So this make a confusion among the patient and other physician that if the patient is having antiarrhythmic anti -arrhythmic drug for maintaining the sinus node, uh, uh, sinus rhythm, and at the same time, why he should also continue the anticoagulant. This is the thing that we have to communicate with our patient and our fellow colleagues very frequently. Other than this actual fibrillation, other uh, other sort of arrhythmia like supraventricular tachycardia, uh, and uh, and the arrhythmia that arises from emerging some uh, emerging uh, disease like Bugeda syndrome and arrhythmogenic dysplasia, uh, which we really understand so little. As a matter of fact, we 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 understand learning Bugeda syndrome and the arrhythmogenic uh, uh, dysplasia from our our students actually. They are, they are the people who first bring it in our notice that sir, this could be Brugada and this could be arrhythmogenic right ventricular dysplasia. 
So it is, it is important, sir, as you said, that the whole country sh should be under the network of electrophysiological study for the sake of learning electrophysiological study and the arrhythmia. Even uh, we have been very keen in learning the electrophysiological study. I myself studied six books of ECG and still ECG seems to be a Greek to me. Uh, ha had we the electrophysiological facilities in the, in the premises, possibly I, I would not have been that ignorant. Thank you, sir. You have been you have been helping us uh, a lot. We know uh, almost you are a listen to us uh, when the question of arrhythmia comes, and arrhythmia is such a difficult uh, difficult chapter to us. And so uh, that is the reason why we remember you all the time. Thank you, Thank sir. You, Mr. Thank you. Sir. Uh, Dr. Kanis, are you there? Dr. Kanis Fatima. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, Kanis, one thing I want from you. What do you, as a teacher of critical care medicine, he is an associate professor in Bergen, uh, what do you actually want from the perspective of uh, teaching? Uh, Rafik sir is here, the resource person is here. We want to learn not only from the cardiac point of view, but also from other subjects. Can you describe a little bit? Thank you, sir. Uh, first, I'd like to uh, express my gratitude to the ECG study group, especially uh, Wadud sir and Abhari sir, for inviting me and our critical care medicine students to participate here. And as an intensivist, uh, I think will be uh, benefited if uh, different types of ECG and uh, how to manage them in case of emergency, a different type of arrhythmia and uh, how to manage them in case of emergency. Like uh, in our ICU, we have to treat the patient first and uh, then talk with the on-call cardiologist later. But first we have to treat them first. So emergency management of uh, different type of arrhythmias uh, will be uh, beneficial for Very all of us. Thank you, thank you. Sir, everybody is waiting for uh, SARS uh, ECG session. But before that, uh, I want to call uh, Professor Zakir Hussain. You are here, Zakir Bhai? Professor Zakir Hussain? Sir, I think we should move to ECG presentation. Uh, there are some, our panelists will be happy to participate in the ECG discussion, I think. Uh, thank you. So we have, uh, today I don't have many. We'll do few um, because it was my lecture day. So. Rafiq Bhai, may, yes. may I have a question to you? Sure. I, ju I just read uh, reading an ar uh, article about the use of the artificial intelligence of predicting the diastolic dysfunctions with the ECG and the clinical features without the resorting to the echocardiography. Uh, there is an article in the Jack the, uh, this week. Oh, what yeah. is your idea of that the artificial intelligence will take place in the coming few years in the interpreting and the all these things? Well, I mean, I think the, the future, if you look at 3D mapping of cardiac arrhythmia, it's amazing that Moshe and Atahar, they can look at a heart on a computer screen in 3D model. It's a totally indirect picture. I mean, the, the, the technology progression is immense. But then again, there are many other technologies that you also remember came and went. So I think this is probably just a new beginning. And, but it's tough to understand how just from the electrical signal, you can convert into a mechanical issue. Uh, one possibility is that if somebody can study this, uh, you remember that there used to be 64 channel, 120 channel EKGs, um, or put all over the heart. Um, but those, recordings disappeared because practically it's not it's impossible to do it um so whether it's going to replace echo or not i, I we have to wait and see uh, because echo gives a direct picture and there is 3d echo now which gives a real real time picture of the heart um there might be a new dimension i think yes in the future, in the future. In the, yes in the supplemental Okay, so um, we will do a couple of ECGs. This one, my 
question is, uh, what is the diagnosis? And what is the mechanism of this arrhythmia? But please don't ignore the initial part of the ECG also. How much time? 30 seconds? Sure. 30 seconds. 30 seconds. 30 seconds. Next seconds. So we start uh, taking up the answers. So, yes, yes. Dr. Khaled Moshin. Hello. Here we can see P wave morphologies of uh, uh, different uh, uh, types actually. Yeah. And uh, uh, then the, the RP interval is also in increased so maybe it's a atrial tachycardia maybe i my uh, my take will be multifocal atrial tachycardia excellent one more comment from mohsin hussein yes sir yeah, mohsin sir mohsin hussein initial didom sir the pov is by feet most likely in india the most of the uh, participants they uh, told that it is uh, large LA, and the rest of the part is uh, POB is not clearly seen, but uh, irregularly. Most likely, actual take you are uh, terminant to active fibrillation. Most likely, and, and uh, most likely, automaticity or re entry, most likely the mechanism. Huh? And you are talking about the enhanced automaticity or re entry. Uh, re entry. Re-entry, but we can see the warm-up phenomenon. What is what was you know as uh, SARS talking? Is it? Uh, uh, if if, if the enhanced, uh, there is no enhanced air. The automaticity rest of the part, rest of the bus most like it could be uh, abnormal automaticity, but sir, sir, now your final your final comment, sir. So there, what are the what are the majority diagnoses? Sir, majority diagnosis enhanced automatic atrial tachycardia. And yeah. Khaled Moshin sir added multifocal atrial tachycardia. Yeah. So I think the initial rhythm is sinus bradycardia with possible left atrial enlargement. And then it starts a tachycardia. The question is, 
If you look at the one before the tachycardia, here is the T wave. If you can see my arrow, and then the T wave is distorted. That means there is a P wave there. Yeah. And that becomes more clear as we move, we can see the P wave. P wave, I cannot see in the other lid, but in lid V1, it looks same looking upward. So that makes the likelihood of multifocal tachycardia less rather than atrial tachycardia. Now, the question is, is it an atrial tachycardia or can it be an, I wish somebody would have said <laughs> AB not DNT or atrial ventricular DNT because I want some controversial answer. And we did not get that. But if we look at this tachycardia, first of all, there is a little bit of warm up, and that suggests automaticity. Second, it is a long RP tachycardia. That means the PR is shorter than RP, which makes it more likely to be an atrial tachycardia or an atypical AV node reentry. And I think this is most likely atrial tachycardia because it starts with the P wave without any PR prolongation. So I think. I agree with the diagnosis. This is atrial tachycardia, possibly automatic mechanism. And um, alternate diagnosis, always there should be an alternate diagnosis. Alternate diagnosis can be a typical AV node reentry. Sir, thank you. Uh, yes. Sir, in presence of SAS clear POA before the QRS. Yes. When clear POA before QRS, should we consider AVNR or AVRT for the differential diagnosis in this ECG? Uh, oh, the question is. I think there should always be a dif differential diagnosis. The reason there should be a differential diagnosis is that if we become too confident about ourselves, then we will misdiagnose. So I think that is the part that is important that, yes, I know it is actual tachycardia, but I think there is always a possibility. That is the, the important, that is the importance of differential diagnosis, either in ECG or in clinical medicine, that I am, I just did not think of one thing. I thought of other things also. That means it tells two things that I also, I know actual tachycardia, I also know other things. So I think that's why differential diagnosis is very important. Can, yes, I, make an... uh, can, 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 can I ask can... something? Yes. Uh, from the clinical perspective, that's what the, uh, the uh, other specialists are particularly wanting to know. Okay, how are you going to treat this patient? But it depends. So before, be, I, before the before the treatment, sir, can I make a comment? Sure. A short comment, please. Please. This Mr. patient Thay. has got yeah. yes, yes. This patient has got features of left atrial enlargement, and as well as there is right axis uh, deviation, which could imply the right ventricular hypertrophy. Also, we find that there is ST de depression, which mimics a reverse T sign. So there is a possibility that possibly this patient is suffering from uh, mitral uh, stenosis or other things, and possibly also on digoxin. And so when we when we relate this arrhythmia with with rest of the picture in ECG, then there is a possibility that this uh, this arrhythmia could be digoxin induced. And in that case, possibly uh, the first diagnosis should be again the automaticity which has induced the atrial tachycardia. Um, uh, I might thinking in a proper way. Yes. Can, I, can I differ? The thing is that this patient has left atrial enlargement, but RPH, only the excess deviation is there, but there is no evidence of RPH. So that's more likely to be left posterior hemiblock. And that means that could be related to uh, uh, increased LPATP and perhaps uh, and not LA because of that. And the T changes are actually related to the ischemia. Otherwise, non-specific change. You cannot obviously say this this P wave changes are ischemic. So uh, this is a very non-specific origin. Uh, basic, Sir, basic, your comment. Basically, basically uh, there is ST depression in all the leads, and it it mimics the reverse T sign. ST depression. I'm say. I look at the TP interval and the ST segment. ST segment depression. There is a clear cut margin of for that. They, at least there should be this level of depression that you can say that this is important. Otherwise, okay. we should not, we should better stay on the diagnosis of non specific ST wave changes before committing to one way or other. Again, yeah. again, I have controversy on other points. Just simple right axis deviation may, may indicate right ventricular hypertrophy. 
single most important feature can clarify right ventricular hypertrophy because it is more common to have RVH rather than to have the left posterior heavy block, especially in the context when we also we have got the left at features of the left atrial enlargement. So I think, unfortunately, I, most of my ECGs I write down the age and uh, clinical content. I don't have it, but there is definitely diatexis deviation. And a lot of patients with COPD can have right ventricular strain uh, without having proper hypertrophy. And that can also, so that uh, fits in with Professor Choudhury's um, um, analysis. And of course, there is some ST depression. So we'll have to look at the background. The question is what to do with, it, with this arrhythmia. The treatment depends on the symptom. I mean, most of these cases, COPD patients have short runs of atrial tachycardia. When we monitor them, they don't even know. If there is no clinical symptom, we should not get carried away treating these patients. Second would be if we have to treat this automatic arrhythmia, they respond very well to calcium channel blocker. Then most of our older patients have hypertension. So if I give drugs like Delta IgM or Verapamil, then um, you can use it in patients with COPD because it doesn't do anything to the lungs. So um, it, it helps in both conditions. Thank you. Unless there is any other comment, I'm sir, going to move. Uh, sir, I have, I, have got, I, have got, I have got one question, sir. Yeah. Uh, since, since there is little, little dispute, although very little, about the morphology of the P wave, whether, yes. whether this is unifocal or multifocal, and, yes. uh, and, and our old teaching is that we, we could use the transesophageal electrocardiogram, which is also known as non-invasive uh, electrophysiology, to see yes. the P wave. Uh, yes. uh, had, had we been this facility, then uh, uh, could, uh, could we make that uh, this patient would also be a candidate for transesophageal electrocardiography to okay, yeah. resolve the whole issue? Yeah, sure. I mean, it's a possibility, but you know, to, with transesophageal echocardiogram, uh, ECG, we used to do it in the past. Uh, we have not done it for a long, long time. And it's a cumbersome thing to do. Most of the, most of the places do not even have the facility. But putting a transesophageal probe will not help us in diagnosing whether it's multifocal or not. Because a transesophageal single electrode will not tell us much about the morphology uh, of it. But the P wave should be. I mean, if, you, if we could see a multiple other leads, and if this P1 showed multiple different morphology, then uh, we could have said clearly multifocal. So this looks very close. But if you look at clinically, it doesn't make any difference um, whether it's multifocal. If, we are, if I'm contemplating ablation, then it is important for me to know whether there is a single morphology or multiple morphology. Because if it is multiple morphology atrial tachycardia, that's is tough to ablate. But if it is um, single focus atrial tachycardia in multiple ECG, then ablation is a choice. So thank you. We'll go to the next ECG. Sir, uh, next, uh, next ECG, yeah. sir. So this is again bringing back the slide that automaticity that we can have automaticity for different reason, um, changing in the threshold um, or maximum diastolic potential or increased slope of the depolarization. Please remember there is a drug, Evabradin. It works in phase four of the action potential of the sinus node. And that's how Evabradin causes sinus rate slowing. So if we have patients with inappropriate sinus tachycardia, Evabradin can be used to decrease the slope of phase four depolarization and that's by slowing the heart rate down. Um, this I think everybody will know. I'm, I'm going to skip because we're running short. I have, so this arrhythmia, I, this is very common. I am showing common things uh, all the time so that we can identify them and not- Thank you, Zamiruddin. Hello. Sir. You shall focus on the answers. Yes, sir. Sir. Uh, we get 10 seconds for 10 seconds more for the ECD. I think it's been discussed earlier a bit. Is the answer still coming?
Yes, majority are in the right direction, I guess, sir. Yeah, two questions, but the same that is the polymorphic and the short set. Yes, sir. Five seconds more, and then we uh, stop uh, stop taking answer and start discussing. Now, before SARS comment, we want to go to some our uh, one or more uh, just faculties. Yes, sir. I think, sir, uh, we start discussing the ECG now. I, mean, I, 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 want to, I want to request. I want to request MZ Azam. Professor MZ Azam. Shahabuddin. Professor Shahabuddin. Muhammad Shahabuddin. Select. Shahabhai Azam. Shahabhai. Shahabuddin Bhai. Shahabuddin Bhai. Will you answer? Any comments about this ECG, Professor Shahabuddin Bhai? Achha. I want to request Shahabuddin, Professor Mohammad Shahabuddin. Sir, I want to say that polymorphic BT for torsor disease point is a motive on this, sir. Acha, you can act on basically the little good anyone? Anyone? Kunota is China, sir. I think it's a right person at Town Shalam, Amadala Firoz. Thank you, sir. Um, sir. In the upper strip, the initial part shows uh, there is sinus bradycardia with prolonged QT interval around 600 milliseconds, and the mid part shows tachycardia, white complex tachycardia. Uh, it, uh, to me, it's a polymorphic VT. So, prolonged QT with polymorphic VT, that is torsor dispontis. Uh, but in the lower panel, the uh, sinus rhythm, there is PR interval, is looks like variable. Yeah. First beat and third beat. In between, there is a ventricular complex. Yes. Ectopic. And the, in the middle part, there is polymorphic VT again. Sir, we have got another expert on VT, Govindo Pal. Thank you, sir. Oh, Khalid Mohsin, hi, please. Is there any in the upper uh, strip? Uh, is there is there any RT phenomena? Sorry, RT phenomena. R RT phenomena in both both the strips. Yeah. Yes, RT is there. Yes. Is fast, fast and uh, upper and lower both strip there is RT phenomena. So, Zamil, what will be the final diagnosis if, uh, and what is the mechanism? Sir, want to know that is the diagnosis and the mechanism. It's most likely uh, uh, prolonged care interval. No, no, no. Automatic CT, early after depolarization, re-entry. What mechanism you want, uh, like to choice? Oh, early hmm. after depolarization. Uh, early after depolarization. Early after depolarization. And the diagnosis? Polymorphic VT. Sir, before going to Ropik sir, Mozumda sir, do you want to make any comments, sir? Don't ask me diff uh, difficult <laughs> questions. <laughs> it, has been, it has been discussed by the uh, so many good uh, ECG readers. So let Ropik by tell the things straight away. What did what did the audience think? Sir, audience, most of the audience commented. Long QT or TDP? TDP, long QT. Yeah. Sir. I, sir, I think, sir, before I think, going, sir, before going to your final comment, I have a question, sir. Yes. Sir, there are some terms for describing the ECG. That is twisting of the axis like this. What does it actually mean, sir? Okay, I am going to show that to you. So, I think simple thing, simple. Basically, something that looks like VF and stops. I think we should for anybody. If we call it torsad, we will not make any mistake. VF rarely stops. If you look at the second strip, you can see that the first beat has a QT interval is about 600 millisecond. There is a PVC, there is a pause, and there is further prolongation pause. of the QT interval. And then there is a VT, whether we call it polymorphic, whatever. But if we look at this VT, look at the R wave here is looking up and then it is looking down. 
Then it is looking up. It is twisting around this. If we take at the Chiruni Nijudi Amdan Guraita Partam, Palijeta Hobe, it will look like that. So that's why it's called Tarsad the point means it is twisting around the point. So keyword is looking up and then looking down, looking up. So this is typical, the second DCG is typical, but the top one, of course, I mean, I agree with the other panelists, you know, this, it looks like polymorphic VT or, but clearly this is long QT associated with bradycardia um, and tarsat. And the mechanism is early after depolarization. And most of these are phase three, because if you look at how far the QRS is from the origin of the arrhythmia, if it were phase two, it would be much earlier Phase two is potassium, calcium current dependent. Phase three is potassium current dependent. And that's why, because, you know, if we give antiarrhythmic medication, those are phase two. I mean, these are for, as I said, theory, you know, the question would be how to treat this patient. One right. is give magnesium. Second, keep the heart rate up. And if we don't have temporary pacemaker, we can always give isopril, isoprenaline drip, or we can give dopamine or dobutamine drip to increase the heart rate. And if we increase the heart rate, it will, get better because as you can see, when the, the it was pause was making this uh, QT much longer. So treatment wise, magnesium as uh, Dr. Kanis Fatima wanted to know if the patient is in ICU, which where the patient is going to be, we're going to give magnesium irrespective of the level of magnesium. Second, what magnesium does is stabilizes the membrane is same as treatment of eclampsia. Second will be to keep the heart rate up. If we can put a temporary pacemaker, that's perfect. If not, then give isoprenaline and uh, also um, give uh, or dopamine or dopamine. Look at this QT interval, this one. This is a short RR interval. The QT is much shorter compared to other places. So that means if we can keep the rate up, the QT will get shorter. So thank you. Uh, 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 sir, uh, question is, in the second step, in the sinus rhythm, the PR interval is prolonged okay. again there is some dissociation. It seems like the second beat, second sinus beat, and later on the last beat, the before one. Uh, there seems to be some dissociation of PUAB. Is it there? This Somebody was asking, is there complete heart block? Is this patient was in heart block? <laughs> the uh, first thing was not. First one, first one is something else. It's yeah. Yeah, another, another thing, sir. I'd like to know R on T phenomena, yes. like twisting of axis. Are here R on T phenomena exactly here? Is there any uh, uh, importance? R on, R on T. Yes, R on T is a historical term that we use. Um, I don't think it means much clinically because if you look at this premature beat, yes, sir. we see a lot of premature beat on the T wave. Not all of them induces VTVF. I remember in the early 80s when I was doing my training, we were so much obsessed with this RNT phenomena. And it is similar to EP study. During EP study, we induced VTVF with um, premature stimulation. Uh, and in a normal heart, we can give as premature as we want to, but we don't induce VTVF. On the other hand, if there is a substrate for VT, we can induce VT. So yes, by term, as you said, it can, we can call it RNT. Uh, but most of the PVCs, um, some of them are later, but majority are somewhere around that time. Yes, by, by definition, we'll call it our own T phenomenon. No question about that. Sir, one more question regarding the treatment, sir. Although yes. it is not the, uh, uh, today is not the topic for the treatment, but uh, this is uh, such a type of PCC. Sometimes many of our colleagues call us, what is the treatment? What is the role of amiodarone in this case, sir? There are some bodies uh, use amiodarone, some bodies advice that is not to use amiodarone. What is the role of the amiodarone in this case, sir? This is one place that I will never not use amiodarone. Yes. Because it will do two things. One, as you can see, this is bradycardia dependent and potassium current dependent block. So if we give amiodarone, this will only make the arrhythmia worse. So the treatment is to keep the rate up use magnesium if there is potassium deficiency, correct the electrolyte abnormality, if there is an offending agent to avoid that. So if there is a, something that is prolonging QT, we should stop that drug. If we have, let's say somebody come to the ICU and I have started erythromycin for something and next day patient goes into the tarsat. 
the first thing that I have to do is to stop the medicine that I started last. And on the top of that, if I then give a medicine which prolongs QT interval, like amiodarone, will make it worse. So I think everywhere, even in this country, in America, there is a reflex tendency to put people on amiodarone, but I think we have to be careful about this kind of arrhythmia. Sir, can I ask one question, sir? Yes. Sir, how the uh, torsadic point is self permitting Is there any mechanism? Um, the question is, <laughs> I this 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 brings into the mechanism because this is basically a form of reentrant circuit. And if you look at supraventricular tachycardia, eventually they extinguish themselves, right? Because at one point the arrhythmia um, cannot continue, and there is a degree of something called wavelength phenomena. And if the certain wave that, that's that's a little bit interesting concept that a lot of these arrhythmias will extinguish themselves because there is no tissue preceding it to continue. Because this is not ventricular fibrillation. This is actually a reentrant circuit uh, inside the ventricle. And it will require sir, different tissue. And that's why sir, it's does, it abolish the, does it abolish the excitatory gap and uh, tarnish the arrhythmia? The excitatory gap that is required. What is it? Sir, excited to the gap. Yes, exactly. When it stops and it, it uh, diminishes the arrhythmia. If there is no gap, that it may will stop. Yes, That's the part. Sir, one of our participants uh, asked to know, uh, that is one to know from you, sir. Is there any role of atrophy, atrophy to increase the heart rate? Does it? Oh, the question is, is can I give atropin? Right, the, the problem with atropin is such a short half-life that uh, it, it is, uh, we do not give atropine for this kind of condition. Yes, sir, this is a question actually. Yes, so because can... atropine is a very short acting medicine. Um, it causes other side effects. So we, we try to avoid because we need a solution that would, because this patient's heart rate is not going to go up and I cannot keep pushing atropine every few minutes. Um, so we have to give something that we can give as a drip. And that, that drip will be isoprenaline dopamine or dopamine one or dop we use dopamine sometimes but the best drug is isoprenaline intervention the reason role of icd for the long term management sir well, the question is is there any role of icd in torsad no uh, long term management no because this is bradycardia dependent torsad so first line of treatment is to get find the etiology of the torsad and treat it and majority of the time it will go away like I have seen patients who who was on amiodarone, develops complete heart block and then develops torsad. Only thing you need to do is to put a pacemaker for to treat the complete heart block. You don't need defibrillator in that patient because it was torsad. Thank sir, you. Uh, uh, sir, next is sir. Sir, yes. I I have I have I have still the confusion about the P wave because uh, it is the traditional teaching that you look at the P wave to solve the arrhythmia. And here in this ECG, as Professor Vadud raised the question, um, I cannot make any anything out, out of P wave and its relationship with the QRS. Yeah. So, this complete heart block. Yeah, I think this was high grade AV block. This patient was initially conducted and then developed heart block because you can see there is a PR. Now one can argue that this conducted, but what about this one? Probably not conducted. This is probably a junctional B. And maybe this P wave conducted, but there is probably another P wave in the middle that did not conduct. And there is probably this. So this patient was going into between complete heart block, probably some conduction. But I think this patient had a high grade AV block. Thank you, sir. Next, Thank you. next ECG, sir. Okay, next ECG was posted on Facebook um, by um, Dr. Saif Tipu from. Cox by that, and one of one of the physicians, I picked up this CCG, and I wanted to. Uh, so this is the ECG. Uh, the, the the RR interval looks a little different, but please remember this was taken with a cell phone, and the QRS uh, the boxes are not correct. So the rate is regular. My question is, what is the arrhythmia? Okay. 
Sir, I give 30 seconds for the ECG because it's yes. a bit complicated one. So, answer has started to come. I'll give you the heart rate is 166 beats per minute. Ten more seconds for answering. There are all types of answers. Okay, that's good. That I like that. I, that's what yes. I want. Five more seconds. That's a professor M. J. Azam. No, sir. No, this is sir. Sir, sir, what do? Sir, sir. This time I want the answer of the participants and then I would like the faculty to support or exclude why they are not correct or incorrect. Okay, sir, we can start discussing the ECD now. Tell the answers. Yeah. Sir, uh, there are many answers. Majority of the answers go in favor of ventricular tachycardia. White complex tachycardia or ventricular Take idea, and there are very few with SVD with average. Okay, that's good. So now, um, oh, Atar, please, yeah. you can run it. Please ask the sir, faculty or. Sir, sir, the faculty, yes, sir. Actually, most of the answers are in favor of the VT. Some of the answers are VT with the aberrations like this. SVT with aberrances, sir. There are some differences. Sir, actually, uh, if time permit, we uh, could go to our participant, but uh, time is short, so we want to directly go to Professor M. Z. Azom. Regarding uh, which one thank you like Thank you, sir. Hmm. It is, Who? sir, I mean, you this, sir, this is carefully to dehi. When a QRS complex wide in almost all the leads, as well as ST elevation evidence in 2, 3 ABF, and among precordial lead, go to the ST depression, widespread ST depression from beyond 2, 2, 3, 4. Five six, okay. Sir, my impression it is to ensure am I with white complex tachycardia with evidence of triple vessel disease, triple vessel disease, RCA, LCX, and uh, LED, triple vessel disease. Am I guess mono it is when it is Sure. Yeah, sure. Comment or what do you want to but underlying ischemia uh, by the it is more favor in VT will work. So, what complex tachycardia more favor in VT instead of a good micro infarction setting? What is that? And I mean, Kaputijan, Jodiam VT Bulitaki, probable diagnosis. Tahule Amar, Ishkimic origin, a triple vessel, a lapunukicho bolam, the Bolte Parina, a Mobolochita. English should easily take a triple vessel disease, a lapolochita. এটা <laughs> I mean, one is the chest depression. There are two, three, 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 the presumption is that when anybody comment about ischemic ST segment changes, the presumption is that we are talking about sinus rhythm. 
if it's not in sinusoidal, those presumptions are invalid. That's the problem. When you are in VT, those presumptions are not valid. Your, your description is beautiful, but that's the problem. Rent is in favor of SVT. And it is very regular. It is in favor of SVT with the uh, aberration conduction with the uh, right band branch block with the aberrant conduction. Sir, systematic analysis for the other part of the next Santa Sebe. Is there any P wave, sir? Uh, uh, there, is P, there is P there is P wave possibly just after a few hours. If 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 you if you look very minutely to all the complex, you'll Maybe. be able to find out a small P wave after Q Q R S. and also st depression can be explained by this uh, uh, no, only, only if you if you concerned with the arrhythmia it is what trophic by says now um, <laughs> sir um, i mean i mean the the p wave that has come after qrs also has produced this st depression uh, that is how the whole thing can be managed sir as, as discussion going on more and more interesting answers are coming okay <laughs> uh, i want party? those Yes, sir. Yes, sir. More part. Sir, I want to call one of our participants. Is what if I time permit? Yes. 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 Sir, Amar Bona is a text based auto answer. Say all answers are but a protected answer. Yes, sir. <laughs> all the differential diagnosis. Yes, sir, yes, sir. So, this 20 is 20 or so. Yes, sir. Sir, should this question, sir? Yeah, they have any station, sir. Hmm? Yes, sir. Should this, sir, sir? Yes, sir. 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 Dr. Dr. Doctor Shudhi. So I, I think the first thing is that it's a right white QRS tachycardia with right yes. bundle morphology. The the problem is that when somebody has white QRS tachycardia. Um, with bundle branch morphology, unless it's typical, it fits into one of our like left bundle with those criteria for acute MI and the patient is having chest pain. I don't think we should get into prediction of ST segment ischemia. It's very tough. It is very tough. But the question is, why QRS tachycardia at a rate of 166 beats per minute the QRS duration is 160 millisecond and a right bundle morphology. So there is one thing that is that if with the right bundle white QRS, more than 140 millisecond, it favors VT. Or left bundle over 160 millisecond favors, I am not saying definitely, it favors VT. Second issue is there is a Q wave in lead V1 and V2, small Q wave. A small Q wave in V1 with right bundle morphology favors VT. Hard is in any chest lead from the beginning of QRS complex to the deepest point of S wave, if it is more than 100 millisecond, that favors VT. And I'm going to bring to the next ECG. The third will be, is that epidemiology? It is very difficult to see. Uh, we can imagine many P waves. We can imagine this is a P wave. I can imagine maybe this is a P wave. So it's tough to say if there is every dissociation or P wave. 
So let's look at the next ECG. I think I, I thought I, I had this, uh, I had the measurements, sorry, I, um, maybe I did not save it. So I measured it actually. If you look at lead V5 from beginning of the QRS to the deep of SOA in V5 is more than 100 milliseconds. So putting mm -hmm. all those criteria, it makes the diagnosis of a VT with the right bundle morphology. Um, let me, um, Sir, avianly je ek to dekhen avianly ki je PF ki mone hai. Yeah, I mean, I I looked at it. Um, sir, screen take to borrow kora jabe sir, screen take to borrow. Sir, one second. I mean, the current slide. Yes, right. Yes. Sir, one or avianly ki HD depression achse sir significant. Oh, yes, there is depression. No, no question about that. Sir, so the question is... One thing is that the ABLA is very One thing is that the ABLA is very good. RCA J2, sir, ST elevation is more... Lead 3 J2, ST elevation, lead 2 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 J2, that's the problem. You are basic initiative of the Bulgur culture. It is, it is. No, no, sir. I mean, it is all this. I am our electrical activity due to the basic pathology. You know, it's a am I by a shirk into tomorrow on no criteria. I can't tell you, but it's a am I. I'm a garbus a criteria. I'm a good job. 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 i am you have to understand that. It's not sinus rhythm. The ST segment and T wave changes are not valid other than sinus rhythm. Sir, I'm going to say that the ventricular take it over side, these is not from the sinus. It's from the yeah. ventricle. The separate okay. rhythm. So it separate is not from the separate rhythm. You cannot diagnose ischemia from there. You can understand some scar bar or MI entry MI is present by Gardusa criteria or those things. But criteria uh, criteria or Chapter's criteria. Acha, Rafiq bhai, why the small Q in the V1, V2 will suggest the ventricular tachycardia? It's, it's, it's just the way it is activated. This is one of the criteria that has been shown. And I'm going to show you another ECG. I'm going to stop share and come back. Um, but in that ECG also, there was uh, excess deviation that also suggested actual VT. There was a uh, positive yeah, target in area. Yeah, we are both were positive. The inferior lead are superior axis as a whole. Two, three AVF were negative complexes. Most likely, sir, fascicular VT, sir. Fascicular yeah. VT, yes, sir. Yeah. Left axis deviation with RBB more. As for the electrophysiologist, for us, general public, we are very happy with VT only. The axis is more length as involved, sir. Yeah. yeah. RBPP with inferior uh, superior axis. LBOT origin, sir. LBOT origin. RBP morphology. Vascular uh, uh, PT is not supposed to be a, a little, a little narrow. It is a 160 millisecond. Was it? Sir, we can find your diagnosis. Uh, this is the. Uh, sir, from the I'm I'm finally, finally, sir. Sir, that the point was said that most of the points are in favor of the VT. Then is QRS duration, RBB morphology, left axis deviation, then R2S near the interval, then AVR positive. All the points are in favor of the VT, and uh, also the presence of the small Q in V1 and V2 also suggests for the VT. So it is. Uh, and Govindo, uh, if it is LVOT origin, that means that uh, uh, the current will be going from up to down. That then the axis should have been. Uh, towards the inferior uh, one, but that's not here. So it's not LVO theology. 
रेकॉर्डिंग just to confirm but unfortunately when i uploaded it didn't upload into the um, file so what i did i took a similar ecg patient who had an icd and i pulled up the intracardiac signals and clearly you can see that there is avid association um so i think i wanted to show only one ecg because this is interesting right bundled pattern um ecg um i'm sorry that i don't have the other ones uh, i think that's the problem of rushing into things Then can we we will stop here right okay sir so uh, how are you going to sir if it is posterior uh, papillary muscle vt or whatever it is how are you going to treat it from clinician's point of view you no know, you know one of the things the fascicular vt i think it's a little too wide initially it looked narrow but if you measure the interval it's pretty wide it's 160 milliseconds I don't believe that this is one of those fascicular VTs. Um, that's number one. Number two is the treatment is of course standard treatment. Um, first of all, uh, depending on the substrate, most probably this patient has cardiomyopathy. If there is cardiomyopathy, then the treatment is simple. Is you need a defibrillator to prolong life. Uh, number one. And secondly, if there is recurrent ventricular tachycardia, you have to use antiarrhythmic medication. And nowadays, what we do. Um, amiodarone of course can be easily used but if somebody is 50 year old and you are using amiodarone on the top of icd you are using it only to um reduce number of icd shock not to prolong life but then we have a lot of side effect from amiodarone so what we try to do if the ef is slightly on the better side let's say 35 to 40% we try to use drugs like sotalol first of all beta blocker aggressive beta blocker if that doesn't work then we try to use drug like sotalol if they can tolerate problem of sotalol is that in patients with heart failure they don't like sotalol they it can worsen heart failure and if a worst case scenario we we'll use amiodarone uh but then minimize the dose as much as possible because the the goal of amiodarone is not to prolong life it to minimize the number of shock and the way i look at it if somebody gets one or two shocks a year that's fine that's why you put the icd in um but if it is getting shocks every week uh every month then it's too many and we have to use an antiarrhythmic medication the other thing would be that if it is always monoclonal vitis and to motion or at heart they can do ablation of the ventricular tachycardia and it, again vt ablation is not a cure but they can modify the sub substrate enough to reduce the number of shocks of the patient sir regarding beta what type of beta blocker here metaprolol or uh, bisoprolol nabiprolol well mm -hmm. question is what type, of beta, beta what type of beta blocker In, all yeah. these patients have cardiomyopathy there are only three beta blockers that have been shown to be beneficial one is carvedilol second bisoprolol third is metoprolol succinate not tartrate even in this country in america lot of cardiologists use metoprolol tartrate in heart failure patients i don't think that is right um so metoprolol i think for arrhythmia metoprolol tartrate we find a little bit better metoprolol succinate is a little better than carvedilol or bisoprolol um but there is no proven data on that but thank you so yeah. it will be only three of those metoprolol succinate carvedilol or bisoprolol sir our mother ji it is uh, more than sir, two sir, hours aap is the patient the manage kar le ki bhabe sir oh this is the bangladeshi patient और क्यों है मैंने स्क्रॉल क्यों है सर नो नो दिस इज अ दिस इज अ पोस्टेड इन द फेसबुक दिस इज अ पोस्टेड ऑन फेसबुक आई डाउनलोडेड इट 
राइट बंडल would have been much thicker than the left but here we have seen that the opposite is happening what is the reason sir oh. if i am not wrong so it's just think, you have to think of a tree a tree goes up there are two branches there is a narrow branch on the right side and a bigger branch on the left side but but uh, right so bundle right, right, bundle right bundle is the direct continuation right bundle is the direct continuation according to book of his bundle is his bundle branches into right and left yes but it says that right bundle branch is the direct continuation of this it just it just goes in the same direction it doesn't mean anything else it, it goes in the same way that is one branch is going directly and another branch is starting toward the left is yeah, it yeah. but that branch is much bigger because it's something much bigger area it's a sakai demand simple जेशन and uh, i am uh, really grateful to uh, dr uh, professor abdul wahid choudhury and i am happy to see my direct teacher uh, professor abdul lal shafi mujumdar in dhaka medical college and i am seeing many of the uh, known face in this screen uh, i am trying to understand the uh, actual uh, mechanism of arrhythmia particularly reentry phenomena and i am uh, somewhat recapitulating my old uh, knowledge uh, and many things uh, actually i learned today and in i think in the next classes that is every saturday i will be here ebong ami onek kichu shikhte parbo ebong shekhar chesta kortechi ebong onek kichu onek kichu complicated mone hocche amar kache jai hok tar poreo रफिक भाइर प्रेजेंटेशन एक्सिलेंट धन्यवाद प्रथम सर অ্যানাউন্সমেন্ট দিবে আর কি যে আমাদের পরবর্তীতে 11 তারিখে একটা বিগ ইস ইস্যু আছে আর আমাদের নেক্সট শনিবার স্যার আপনার মনে আছে তো স্যার রবি স্যার আগামী শনিবারও কিন্তু কিন্তু আপনার লেকচার অ্যাট্রিয়াল টেক এর দিয়া শিওর ইয়া স্যার ওকে আমাদের নেক্সট শনিবার দিনও কিন্তু রবি স্যার এর প্রোগ্রাম অ্যাট্রিয়াল টেক এর দিয়ার উপরে নেক্সট নেক্সট স্যাটারডে আর এক তুমি ওই এটা দেখাবা পোস্টারটা দেখাবা আর আমাদের একটা পোস্টার আছে একটা বড় ইস ইস এর প্রোগ্রাম আছে রবি স্যার এর সঙ্গেই তো এই পোস্টারটা আমার মনে আছে তারিখ দেখাও তো একটু আর শাহাবুদ্দিন ভাই সিলেক্ট শাহাবুদ্দিন फ्रेंडर <laughs> 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 <laughs>
ওনার প্রচুর ফ্যান আব্বা এখানে জুনিয়র ছাত্রদের মধ্যে হলো সাংঘাতিক জনপ্রিয় আমি দেখাচ্ছি একটু পরে দেখাচ্ছি স্যার আচ্ছা ঠিক আছে দেখিয়ে দাও আচ্ছা একটু একটু পরে দেখালে আমি একটা শুধু ততক্ষণ তুমি তারিখ রেডি হলে আমাকে বলো আমি রেডি স্যার তাহলে দেখাও তাহলে শেয়ার স্ক্রিন করো टार्गेट মানে ইচ্ছা অনুযায়ী হয় সেই অনুযায়ী কিন্তু প্রোগ্রামটা হবে আমাদের ওয়ান অফ দা স্পিকার রুফিক স্যার এবং আরেকজন হচ্ছে ও মানে অভিষেক দেশমুখ উনি হচ্ছে মেয়ো ক্লিনিকে আছেন তো এই দুটেই হবে আমাদের মানে মেইন ফ্যাকাল্টিস এবং আমাদের এই প্রোগ্রাম হচ্ছে ফ্রাইডে স্যার মজুমদার স্যার মানে কিছু স্যার আপনার সঙ্গে একটু ওভারল্যাপ করবে মনে হয় স্যার এখানে একটু না পুরোটাই তো ওভারল্যাপ করবে আমি ওভারল্যাপ করব স্যার আমরা আসলে উনার সাথে একটা টাইম মিলাতে পারছিলাম না আমেরিকার সাথে सार्कुलेट कर আমাদের এই প্রোগ্রামের মাধ্যমে যাতে করে আমি মনে করি যে এটা খুবই ইউজফুল প্রোগ্রাম হবে ওয়াদুদ ভাই আতা ভাই এটা কি শনিবার না এটা শুক্রবার শুক্রবার ফ্রাইডে ফ্রাইডে মর্নিং টাইম টেক কম টাইম টাইমটা 10টা থেকে 12টা 10টা থেকে বাংলাদেশ টাইম 10টা থেকে 12:30 টা সকাল 10টা সকাল 10টা হ্যাঁ সকাল 10টা আর সাহেব ভাই আপনার ফ্যানদের একটু বলে দিন প্লিজ জি আর একটা হলো 9:30টা থেকে 12টা এটা ও ওটা ইন্ডিয়া ইন্ডিয়া টাইম আর আপনি ওই সময় যদি কলকাতায় থাকেন এটা 5 তারিখ 11 তারিখ না 11 তারিখ আগামী 11 তারিখ মজুদ স্যার স্যার এটা তাহলে ইশের করে তিনটা সাত থেকে নিয়ে বিকালে না স্যার টাইম আগে আনা যায় কেন স্যার যদি 8টা আনতে পারে না না টাইম আগেতে পারবেন না ওটা স্যার আসলে ওটা বিকালে হলে পরে আমরা মিস করতে চাই না ওটা ওটা খুব ভালো প্রোগ্রাম হয় না না আমরা ওটা ওটা ভালো প্রোগ্রাম আমরা হ্যাঁ দেখি আই ডোন্ট ওয়ান্ট টু মিস ইট আমার টিমের সাথে কথা বলে দেখি ওরা কি বলে अच्छा आप तो उसे इस इसी तरह देखें थे एक बीच बीच लिस्ट अच्छा एक अच्छा आवादर फाइनल आवादर लास्ट फर्स्ट सर आवादर मुनाहज़ ए इसी तरह सर फेसबुक पे पोस्ट करा चलो रूपी सर के बोले सर आपने क्या मैं किंतु जे फेसबुक के इनवाइट करती हूँ एर पर आमी आरेक तू अपडेट कर ले আপনি স্যার এটা দেখতে পারবেন নাকি তো এইটা আমাদের ইসিসি অফ দা উইকে ফেসবুকে এটা আপলোড করা ছিল এবং আমার মাঝে কনগ্রাচুলেশন টু প্রফেসর আব্দুল ওয়াদুদ मोस्ट অফ দা পার্টিসিপেন্ট কারেক্টলি অ্যানসার যে এটা হচ্ছে ওয়ালেন সিনড্রোম मोस्ट অফ দা পার্টিসিপেন্ট আমার মাঝে একজনও মিস করে নাই এবং এটা আমাদের প্রফেসর ওয়াদুদের গত লেকচারে এটা ছিল তো ওয়াদুদ ভাই আপনি এটা পড়ে বলেন এটা ওই যে আমরা ইয়েতে যাই বলনতে যাই বলনার মধ্যে আপনি আসলে খুব সুন্দর করে লিখে দিয়েছেন এই যে দেখেন 
এই জিনিসটা সবার আগে আমি জোর দিচ্ছি দেখেন ওই যে রফিক স্যার আমাদের কাছে দুটো জিনিস শেখাইছেন এক নম্বর হলো সিস্টেমেটিক সিস্টেম হইতে ফলো করে শুধু ডায়াগনোসিস আহারি করে যেও না দুই নম্বর শেখাইছেন হ্যাভ ডিফারেন্স অফ অপিনিয়ন মাল্টিপল অপিনিয়ন সেটা কোনো আপত্তি নেই এখানে আমরা রেটটা দেখতে পাচ্ছি রিদম সাইডাস কিউরেস নরমাল এগুলো সবই দেখছি কিউরে দেখলাম এরপরে লিখছি এসটিটি অফ চেঞ্জেস মিনিমাল এস্টিলেশন ইফ ইউ ওয়ান্ট টু ভিজি প্রিজার্ভ আউটার প্রোগ্রেশন উইথ বাইফেজেক্টিভ ডায়াগনোসিস ওয়েল এস সিনো কেন শেরিক বলা হচ্ছে আবার ইসি তে ব্যাক করেন ইসি ইসি তে তে ব্যাক করেন হ্যাঁ ইসি তে এক স্লাইড দেখতে পাচ্ছেন ইসি তে হ্যাঁ এখানে দেখেন বলা আছে 56 এর ওল্ড এন্ড ডায়াবেটিক বয়স মেল পারসন ডায়াবেটিক অলরেডি রিস্ক ফ্যাক্টর আছে ইসিটি চারটা ফেডবিশন এর সিসিউ এডবিটি উইথ 15 আওয়ার্স অফ হিস্টরি অফ সেন্ট্রাল চেস্ট পেইন উইথ মিনিমাল এক্সারশন বিপি নরমাল সাইন্স অফ হার্ট ফেইলিয়র নাই স্লাইটলি এলিভেটেড কার্ডিয়াক প্রপোনি বাট এটাকে ঠিক এসটি এলিভেটেড এমআই বলা যাচ্ছে না টিপিক্যাল যে কোভিন যেটা সেটা নাই এটা এসটি এলিভেশন আছে বাট ওরকম না কিন্তু দা টি ওয়েবটা ডিসটিনটলি বাইফেজ এটা হলো ওয়েলেন্স সিনড্রোমের বৈশিষ্ট্য এখন আমরা উত্তরে যাই আবার একটু উত্তরে ফার্স্ট স্লাইডটা আবার হ্যাঁ দেখা যায় না ফার্স্ট স্লাইড হ্যাঁ এই দেখেন রিসেন্ট এনজাইনে আছে নরমাল স্লাইড এলিভেটেড কার্ডিয়াক মার্কার আইসোইলেক্ট্রিক অর মিনিমাল স্টিল লিভেশন ডিপলি ইনভার্টেড হয় অথবা বাইফেজিক টি হয় ডিপলি ইনভার্টেড বেশি বা ক্ষেত্রে বাইফেজিক টি টা বেশি ক্লাসিক্যাল সেটা মাত্র 25% ক্ষেত্রে সবচেয়ে বেশি ইম্পর্টেন্ট হলো দিস ইজ হাইলি স্পেসিফিক ফর ক্রিটিক্যাল স্টেনোসিস ফর প্রক্সিমাল এলিটি দিস ইজ অ্যাকিউট করনার সিনড্রোম বাট নট স্টিল লিভেটেড এমআই এবং এটা হলো ইন্ডিকেশন দ্যাট এই پیشنট কে খুব আর্লি আমরা ক্যাথলেবে নিয়ে যাও না হলে দিস پیشنট মে ডেভেলপ ইনটু এক্সটেনসি এন্ট্রোএমআই অর কার্ডিয়াক অ্যারেস্ট দিস ইজ দ্য মোস্ট ইম্পর্টেন্ট থিং একে আমি আর্লি ইনভেসিভ নর জন অ্যাগ্রেসিভ ট্রিটমেন্ট করতে হবে পরে তাকে আমাকে আর্লি ক্যাথলেবে নিয়ে যেতে হবে এটা সব তিনটা ইম্পর্টেন্ট জিনিস এটা স্যার টাইপ এ অর টাইপ বি ওয়েল এন্ড এটা হলো তোমার বাইফেজিক হলো এ টাইপ এটা আর ডিপ ইনভার্টেড হলো টাইপ বি এটা কিন্তু বাইফেজিক বাইফেজিক জি স্যার বাইফেজিকটা ক্লাসিক্যাল বর্ণনা ছিল কিন্তু ওটা হলো 25% ক্ষেত্রে বেশিরভাগ ক্ষেত্রে আমরা ডিপলি ইনভার্টেড টি ওয়েব পাই সিমেট্রিক্যাল টি ওয়েব ডিপলি ইনভার্সন পাই বড় বড় টি ইনভার্সন বাট দ্যাট অলসো ইন দ্য সিমিলার ব্যাকগ্রাউন্ড উইথ প্রিজারভেশন অফ আর ওয়েব that goes in favor of wellen syndrome proximal lat critical stenosis acute coronary syndrome আচ্ছা তাহলে এটা বন্ধ করি রফিক স্যার আপনার লেকচার স্যার খুব সুন্দর লেকচার দিয়েছেন স্যার আপনি আর কিছু বলতে না আমাদের উদ্দেশ্যে थैंक यू না थैंक यू ভালো লাগে আই এনজয় ডুইং দিস ইট কিপস মাই ব্রেন ফ্রেশ ইট কিপস মি फ्रॉम গেটিং ওল্ড थैंक यू পার্টিসিপেন্ট সবাইকে বলছি রফিক স্যার আমাদেরকে সবাইকে বলতে মানে যেটা শিখিয়েছেন যে ইন্টারেকচুয়াল ডিবেটে তো ফিলোসফি ডিবেট করব কোনো আপত্তি নাই বাট এট দ্য এন্ড অফ ডিবেট ছয় একসাথে মিলে মিষ্টি খেতে চলে যাব আচ্ছা আবার মানে সারে যে এটিটিউডটা আমরা কিন্তু তার ফলোয়ার আচ্ছা বিফোর কনক্লুডিং স্যার আবার মানে যে পাচ্ছিলাম না বাট মাহবুব রহমান বাবু স্যার উনি ইন্টারেস্ট নিয়ে আমাদের প্রত্যেকটা প্রোগ্রাম থেকে বাবু শুনতে হচ্ছে স্যার স্যার নাইস আসসালামু আলাইকুম थैंक यू স্যার রফিক স্যার জানেন স্যার আমার একদম বুকের মধ্যে একটা স্যার উনি আমাদের টিচারের টিচার স্যারের প্রত্যেকটা লেকচার আসলে প্রত্যেকটা ফেলোর জন্য খুব হেল্পফুল হচ্ছে এবং আমি জানি পরীক্ষাতে তারা এত ইজি হয়ে যাবে ইসিজি গুলা এবং এই যে আজকে যেগুলা স্যার আলোচনা করলেন যে এগুলো খুবই হেল্পফুল হবে এবং ওই শাহাবুদ্দিন স্যার শুধু না আমাদের ওয়াদুস স্যার সহ আতার স্যাররাও স্টুডেন্টদের একদম বুকের ভিতরে ঢুকে গেছে এই বিশেষ করে এই আমি বলবো এই করোনাকালীন টাইমটাতে ওয়েবিনারে তারা তারা ভাবে নাই যে পাঁচ মাস তারা এত সুন্দর করে ক্লাস করে তারা তাদের লেখাপড়াটা কন্টিনিউ করতে পারছে এই জন্য রফিক স্যার সহ আমি যারাই অর্গানাইজার আমি সবাইকে ধন্যবাদ জানাই আমি শুধু স্যার এটার সাথে একটু সাজেশন দিই যে পোস্টারটা যে করেছেন পোস্টারটাতে দুইজন ইউএস এর রফিক স্যার এবং আমাদের ওই ডক্টর সাহেব দুজন ইউএস এ লেখা আছে এটা যদি আমাদের যারা আছেন আপনারা তিনজন আপনি ওয়াদুস স্যার আতার স্যার তুষার তাদের নামের নিচেও যদি বাংলাদেশটা থাকতো আমাদের 
যারা বাংলাদেশ থেকে করছেন যে নিচে বাংলাদেশ যদি লিখে যদি ওয়াদুস স্যারের ঢাকা মেডিকেলে ঢাকা লেখা আছে কিন্তু ঢাকা বাংলাদেশটা লিখলে আমার মনে হয় যে পোস্টারটা আরো অনেক সুন্দর হবে ধন্যবাদ রফিক স্যার আপনাকে অনেক ধন্যবাদ সবাই দেখ স্যার থ্যাংক ইউ ভেরি মাচ আমার মনে ওয়াদুস ভাই আপনি কনফিউজ করে দেন আর ভ্যাকসিন কোকে অসংখ্য ধন্যবাদ তারা এটা আমাদের সাথে আছে মজুমদার স্যার সব সময় দেখি এই তুমি এই প্রোগ্রামগুলো স্যার যদি খেয়াল করেন তাই কখনো মিস করেন না একটু একটু কমেন্ট আছে স্যার আমার যদি গোবিন্দ মাবিশিগের প্রতিনিধি আমাদের শ্রী মাছ উই हैव লার্ন এ লট ফ্রম ইউর টক আচ্ছা হ্যাঁ রিগার্ডিং বেসিক মেকানিজম অফ অ্যারিথমিয়া অলসো ইসিজি আমাদের মাইমেশিয়ে কিন্তু স্যার ক্যাট ল্যাব চালু হইছে আর কি বসানো মেশিন বসানো হইছে এখনো মানে শুরু হয়নি স্যার আর কি দেখব ইনশাআল্লাহ হবে আপনি আপনি যখন আসবেন তখন আর কি আপনি কি জানেন স্যার এটা যে ক্যাথলে বসানো হয়েছে স্যার শুনছি শুনছি আমি জি শুনছিলাম অনেকবারই বলছেন তো ধন্যবাদ স্যার অসংখ্য ধন্যবাদ স্যার আপনি সবাইকে ধন্যবাদ আসসালামু আলাইকুম স্যার আমার মনে হয় যে আজকের লেকচার আমরা যেমনটি চাইছিলাম আমাদের স্যার প্রায় মানে আমাদের এই জুমে এবং প্রায় ফেসবুক মেলে মোর দ্যান ফোর হান্ড্রেড পার্টিসিপেন্ট ছিল এবং আমার মনে হয় যে এভরিবডি এনজয়েড ইউর লেকচার এবং আমার মনে হয় যে স্যার বিশেষ আমাদের এমনি এই ইসিজির প্রোগ্রাম তো পছন্দ করেই তার উপরে বিশেষ করে যখন আপনার কথা শুনে তখন আরও বেশি এটা ইন্টারেস্ট ফিল করে এবং আমি আমার এই প্রোগ্রামে সার্বক্ষণিক আমার মনে হয় যে ধৈর্য ধরে আমাদের যে প্রফেসর মজুমদার স্যার তারপরে প্রফেসর শাহাবুদ্দিন সামনে প্রোগ্রাম এবং আমাদের আগামী শনিবার দিনের প্রোগ্রাম আমাদের প্রত্যেক দিনের রফিক স্যারের কিন্তু স্টেশন থাকে স্যার এভরিডে রফিক স্যারের মেন টক থাকুক বা না থাকুক এভরিডে দেয়ার স্টেশন অফ দ্য রফিক স্যার হিসাবে <laughs> আলাইকুম <laughs> 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 <laughs>